I, of course, want to express my thanks uh, to the conference organizers. Um, and I express them not only on my behalf, but on the behalf of my co-author, Nick Constantino. Uh, because we have 20 minutes, it was decided that I would give the paper, but this paper was truly written by the two of us. Um, and uh, one should uh, not take his contribution uh, lightly. Um, I'm going to first talk about the main ideas of the paper because as is typical for conference, no one ever gets the papers read in time. Um, so um, here are the main points of the paper. It was a lengthy paper um, and uh, you can figure out whether it's worth consulting afterwards. Um, my, our strongest point, point number one, um, is that there is no ritual system in place um, in Jangdi's reign. Um, and uh, that's 300 years into the Han uh, ruling house um, and 55 years into Eastern Han. And were a system to be in place, uh, we would expect it, as you will soon see, to be described um, as a, a fixed ritual, a ding, uh, Lee, um, or a bay, a completed ritual or set of rituals. And what we'll see from the slides is there is no such dinging, fixing, and completing. Um, uh, the second point I would emphasize is that uh, the ongoing debates um, about ritual concern nearly every possible aspect of ritual. Who is actually being honored in the ceremony? Who performs the ritual? Who attends the ritual and why? Where are the rituals to be performed? And are the rituals to be conducted at regular or irregular intervals? Those are just the biggest questions um, that are being asked. My third point is that we often, and I completely put myself here, um, take a line from a treatise and go, okay, now we know what's going on. And the view from the top, um, either from the basic annals of the emperors or from the treatises on ritual in the Hanshu and the Ho Hanshu, um, that couldn't be more misleading um, in failing to discuss uh, debates on ritual. Um, and uh, the Ho Hanshu, uh, uh, quite unlike the Hanshu, does concede that the rituals are piling up and there are more and more possible models and more innovations. And, and so uh, gives you the sense that now something is actually going to have to be done. My fourth point is that to find the ritual debates one must consult the individual biographies in the histories and the extensive controversial literature that exists from the period. Um, and my fifth point is the reason this talk and the paper in general focused on Zhang Di's reign is because we happen to have for that period an unusually great number of biographies of ritual masters and also two major works of controversial literature, the Bohutong, uh, the White Tiger Hall Conference, um, and uh, also Xu Shen's Wu Jing Yi Yi, which is available only in fragments, but uh, hefty numbers of fragments. Um, so we can gain from it a sense of these ritual debates. Okay, what I mean is we often look at the top um, is if we looked at Mingdi's reign in AD 59, uh, we are told, uh, well, uh, these rituals were finally completed. Okay, so fine. Uh, we look at that and the language is uh, bay, completed, it's unambiguous. Uh, well, the only problem is, is that if we go two emperors later, <laughs> Um, we have a ritual master saying, gee, I hope before I die that something gets fixed um, and actually completed. Um, and really, one can multiply these examples over and over again. Um, and the main point is, is that in all of my readings from Zhang Guoqin Han, I have never seen a fixing of the ritual. 
Um, and I think the answer is these are too important um, and there are too many precedents to argue from. Um, so not just the ritual texts, in fact, in the Han period, you're usually arguing about what right should be done on the basis of the Shangshu, the documents. So uh, we have to see a much broader picture in order to know what we're actually looking at. So um, I want to turn to um, a ritual master who slightly predates the period. Um, and that's because um, I want to speak about uh, him. Um, he is so important uh, to the whole Han Dynasty legitimacy project um, that Mingdi virtually invented. There's a precursor in the Wangmang period, but Mingdi virtually invented um, the honoring aged ceremony in, uh, only to honor him. Um, and what we have um, is Mingdi positioning him um, and asking other ritual masters to stump him, basically, to give him hard questions. And then whenever Huan Rong answers, Mingdi says, that is the correct answer. Um, and this is part of the positioning of Mingdi um, as a legitimate ruler. At one point, Mingdi with another, um, some same family of Huans, um, presents himself, he says, I am Confucius and you are my disciple. And, and now this uh, kind of teaching will go on. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to say is, uh, here's a typical, uh, if you look at the biography, um, here's a typical biography of a ritual master, except the odd thing about this biography is of all the ritual masters that I have examined, this is the only person who does not hold a high military position at the same time. Um, and I think it's because he came to court at the age of 60. He's probably already past um, his uh, military years. Um, but I think we frequently contrast ritual and law or ritual ways of doing things plus military. Um, and if you know the classics, I think that's an anachronistic uh, division. So I wanted to bring him up simply as uh, really an exception, but a powerful exception. Um, here are some of the other people we examined. We could have added um, more than this. Um, and you see that they served in uh, quite high positions uh, in the military, as well as being a master of ceremonies uh, at the imperial rituals. Um, so um, I wanted to turn now to the most important ritual master uh, during the time of Zhang Di, and this is uh, Cao Bao. Um, Zhang Di, and he's a much debated figure all the way through the Ming Qing period uh, because the question was, was he filial or not? Because he didn't bury his father according to um, uh, the previous rituals. Um, uh, so he's a, uh, Zhang Di is, uh, occupies, he's undoubtedly the most powerful Eastern Han emperor. Um, and he really wants to revise uh, rituals and music for himself and for the strength of the dynasty. So he goes to Cao Bao and says, I want you to redo it. We had Shu Sun Tong in the Western Han. I want you to do it for the Eastern Han. And he creates a, an enormous uh, um, uh, work that is in 150 chapters. Okay. Um, for those of you who know Chinese, you know what that means. Uh, many, many times uh, um, the normal length of the rites text. Um, but I would draw your attention to the bottom under career highlights. Um, first of all, um, he's credited with all kinds of achievements in his own lifetime. Um, but as soon as John D dies, the accession and capping ceremony for the successor followed Cao Bao, and then um, officials say he should be executed. And so this brings up the tension always about when do you revise, when do you not revise. And in many of these discussions, uh, the theme is this, um, that uh, the only precedent is you must keep revising. 
um, that um, every ruler adds to this corpus and innovates and, and changes. Um, so um, uh, we now have um, uh, a selection from the paper. Um, and uh, what Cao Bao tells Zhang Di, he knows Zhang Di wants to revise. Um, and what he tells him, but he's not alone in making the same argument, um, is that to be a real emperor, you must revise the rituals and the music, and you have the legitimacy to do it. Um, after which, he's commissioned by Zhang Di to do this, um, and then Zhang Di um, uh, consults Ban Gu, who's familiar to us for other reasons, as the author of the Hanchu. And Ban Gu says, no, 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 you don't leave it to one man to do it. You convene another court conference, uh, just like the Bo Hutong in 79. Um, and we will solve all these issues. And Zhang Di says, no way. I've had it with court conferences. Um, I need one person, just as Shun needed one music master, Kuei. One is enough, OK? Um, but what's interesting is Zhang Di, in his own lifetime, never forces these new ritual on his own court, which tells you something about the most powerful emperor um, is fearing the reaction of his own court. Um, I'd like to turn to some of the ritual controversies just to give you a sense of how profound they are. Um, we begin with the Ming Tang, and I think immediately of Michel Pirazzoli, uh, who said that the Ming Tang is a pâté de chou. Um, and I said, what do you mean, a cream puff? She said, a lot of hot air. OK, so um, um, actually, I think it's a little bit less air than some later um, things, uh, accounts have made it. The first thing that's really surprising is according to Cheng Da Cheng, who knew more about Chang'an and Western Han than any scholar I can think of, uh, um, there was no Taishria in Western Han at all. And it's very interesting that so far I don't believe any archaeologists have found anything to be identified as such. Um, the second thing is equally interesting. Ming Di, this powerful emperor, nearly dismantles the Taishria. By the way, we uh, translate the Taishria erroneously as a university, uh, correctly as ritual center or uh, maybe academy, imperial academy. As long as we don't, as long as we think of the Greek model of academy, that many things are taking place there. Um, uh, he nearly dismantles this on the grounds that it's superfluous. He has a biyong. Why does he need a taishria? The taishria is very small in Eastern Han. It could not possibly hold the numbers of students that are reported of it in the Ho Hanshu uh, by a long shot. And I'm not the first person to know this, Lu Samian, but as you'll see from the next slide, uh, it's totally impossible. Uh, if they have correctly identified the taishria, it's tiny. Um, and it could not hold tens of thousands of students. Um, I want to say that the role of the Ming Tang is very unclear, as multiple texts, including Tsai Yong's essay on that subject, the Ming Tang Lun, um, equate the Ming Tang with the Taimiao, the imperial ancestral temple. And they simply say, when we're doing certain, focusing on certain kinds of ceremonies, we call it one thing. When we're focusing on something else, we call it something else. So I immediately went to go back and look at Hans Bielenstein and where did he locate Luoyang in later Han times, an imperial ancestral temple. He shoved it up in the north, but there is no text attached to it. There is not a single record of, of where it should be. So it's a very peculiar thing. I mean, he clearly wanted to put it on a map, but he never discusses it, and Ho Hanshu doesn't discuss it either. Um, the plan of the Ming Tang is not at all the same in Western and Eastern Han, confirming that there were debates about what it should look like, how many rooms, what its function was, all of that. Um, and the Biyong and the Lingtai functions are very clearly specified, and they're ritual centers each for certain ceremonies. 
Okay, so they're not problematic. So um, I just let you look briefly at the Western and Eastern Han uh, Ming Tang. The furthest away from me is the Eastern Han. This is the Western Han. Um, we have what has been identified as a Ming Tang uh, in the Western Han. Um, and it's a, a peculiar complex that doesn't actually match any ritual text or any text from the Han period. Okay, So we simply uh, kind of look at it and wonder what we're doing. Um, turning to the Eastern Han Ming Tang, um, if you look uh, at the big red arrow, that is the entire site of the Taishue as identified by archaeologists. If they have identified it correctly, it occupies six acres. The central campus of Berkeley is 123 acres the full cam cam for the same number of students for the Taishue. Um, and the whole campus, which is to take that entire number, is uh, 1,232 acres. Okay? When you read Han Dynasty accounts of what's going on, and Lu Semien knew this in 1920 and 1930, uh, what you're talking about is clients who may at some point attend a ceremony, um, and uh, they get honor from having attended that ceremony. So clearly there were some Boshu, and they did have disciples, but clearly at some point in the Eastern Han, disciples and clients uh, fail to be distinguished, and the numbers just start uh, being inflated uh, beyond belief. Um, so whereas many people, I emphasize this, whereas many people take the sign that there were 30 to 40,000 students at the Taishue, and then they say Imperial Academy as a sign of growing literacy in the period, um, it, it's crazy um, to do this. Um, okay, I turn to another ritual controversy. Um, and it's the identity of the six origins. Gu Gang has identified 21 different theories of what the Liozong are, uh, but I give seven that are extremely important in the Han period and the subject of ongoing debates. Now, if you think about it, this is the most solemn sacrifice that the emperor makes to whom? He doesn't apparently know whom he's even offering his ritual to, um, nor does his court. Um, so again, we can think of orthopraxy. He knows that he must uh, offer this sacrifice. Um, but uh, the theological questions, which often plague us, what does he think he's doing, um, I think are completely irrelevant um, to this issue. He knows he's being reverent to the powers, that's enough, okay? And that's enough to demonstrate uh, his superiority. Um, if we look at the five sacrifices, it's exactly the same thing. Here are the main questions that are asked, and if you look at it carefully, it's every single question that could be asked. Who are the five sacrifices? That's never settled. Who are the objects of the cult? Who's allowed to offer cult? At what level? Different people think from the emperor on down to the common people. Some people think only the emperor. Some people think only the commoners. It, you begin to go, uh, really, I just don't know what's going on. Um, and I'll simply mention the third. At the fifth five sacrifices, some people say uh, at each of the four seasons you uh, do this, and then at the midsummer section uh, you worship the fifth. That makes great sense in cosmological terms, except no one can agree on that. Okay? Um, and so they do not agree whether it's regular or irregular, and some people would say you make these sacrifices on the point of death. Oh no, you make these sacrifices when there's been an earthquake or a flood. Oh no. You know, so there we go on. Um, uh, so uh, we produced an appendix uh, which has a number of items in it, um, but really uh, every single issue here is up for debate. Uh, accumulating precedence doesn't resolve anything. Uh, what it does is complicate uh, the decision-making process. 
um, and make it, uh, I think, impossible uh, to resolve. Um, so I end my talk there um, and bring us back uh, to the original point that um, uh, Nick and I wanted to emphasize. If you read, and it's not just Chinese, but they're always talking about uh, uh, the ritual system um, uh, as uh, stretching back um, into hoary antiquity. Uh, the key point is as horrified as I am by a wedding couple uh, uh, inscribing the Chinese constitution on their wedding night. Um, you know, um, uh, there's never been a ritual system and it's only been in some people's minds that there ought to be a ritual system. Um, and that was a powerful notion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for this always quite <laughs> challenging uh, point of view. And in fact, uh, reminding us of what was also said this in the first round with, by, by Alain and uh, Marianne, that this uh, gap between the text or the, the, the let's say, the liti as a symbol and the reality. Yeah. Yeah. So for even for the morning rites, which are supposed to be the, the, the core of the right. DT and the, all the Confucian or literati tradition, even there, it uh, yes. doesn't work. Even Zhu Xi can't uh, then, figure uh, out. Not speaking of Zhu Xi, this <laughs> will <laughs> Yes. But let's say, at least for the Jango, the, the ancient period, up to the Han, we can, we, you now show from the, yeah. the, the historian point of view, that also you have that gap in, in the Han. There, there was also the same problem that, so my question there may be, and I open the floor also, would be, so what are these texts for? Are yeah. they just creation of uh, this uh, classicist, literati, what, uh, group of people, philosophers or whatever, who, who, who f have this fantasm about uh, having this perfect order, uh, or <laughs> is it something else coming from we can go to also to what uh, Mike uh, Puet told mm -hmm. us this morning, this kind of aggregation, I mean, bottom-up construction of those rituals. Uh, how do you see that? Uh, uh, I thing? have two tentative answers. Um, the first is from the top, and the first is from a slightly lower level, the people who are creating these uh, texts like Bo Hu Tong and uh, Wu Jing Yi Yi. Uh, from the top, uh, and this is a very crude analysis, but that's the only place I am at this point, at the level of crudity. Um, from the top, it is extremely clear that the Eastern Han, uh, even under Zhang Di, the most powerful emperor, does not have the power that the Western Han had, and they know it. Um, and so uh, instead of ruling as Ba Wang, as hegemons, um, they say, we uh, as emperors will become ritual masters and patrons of classical learning. And of course this began in Western Han that this would be another source of legitimacy. That's the view from the top. Uh, from the view of these people who are doing it, uh, I had a small section in the paper and really it should be developed by both of us. Um, and that is why uh, do we keep seeing this mess? Why don't they leave it alone? Um, and my, we tend to forget, because we read this as disembodied uh, people and uh, ideas and things like this, that every ritual, uh, the participants at the ritual um, uh, gained uh, prestige and authority themselves uh, from participation in the ritual. It's so clear in some of the Eastern Han tombs and the murals uh, that, uh, you know, that, they, uh, that participation in these rituals put you in the power circle. Um, and so I think uh, the reasons why people can't get rid of these debates is say I'm basing, I'm the teacher for the Ouyang documents and you're the teacher for the Qingshu Li, the rites. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you know, uh, my authority depends on my winning out in these debates, and I will then be rated more highly. Uh, my teacher is Nathan Sivan, and I honor him in all respects except one. He said the Chinese were ironic, uh, peaceful. No, this is a competitive uh, arena, and they are always jockeying uh, to get closer to the emperor um, and closer to the Wai Qi and other sources of, of power. So uh, it's a crude answer. Uh, I'm sure it's more complex than that, uh, but this is my initial crude sociological um, answer.